Hey everybody, I've uh, got a little bit of time this afternoon. So yeah, this afternoon. So uh, I thought I'd hop on here and see how everyone is doing. So got about hour, hour and a half, something like that uh, to hang out and chat. So come say hi. I'm just going to share this link on a few places. And then uh, as we will, as the great poet once said, get down to business and uh, defeat the Huns. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Hope everybody's doing all right today. Hi, Mitchell, welcome. Hi, Michael, Kat, Dave, Audrey. Thank you for uh, coming and hanging out for a little bit. <clears throat> hey, everybody. What about the rapture? Done a handful of videos on the rapture, uh, which seems to have been developed in the early 1800s. I think 1833 is when we get the, the first real full articulation of it. Um, <clears throat> and it is based on, most scholars agree, a, uh, a reading of uh, 1 Thessalonians, what is it, 714, 2, uh, 417, I forget what the passage is, that uh, most scholars don't consider to be uh, a great reading. I think it's 417. Yeah, uh, this idea that they'll be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, the idea that this means everybody's going to then do a U-turn and head up to heaven uh, is not what the imagery is likely referring to. The imagery is likely based on this idea that you go out to meet the returning sovereign to their city to then usher them into their city. And so the idea is everybody gets caught up into the air and then turns back around and comes down to earth. <clears throat> Hi, Derek. Joe Parker, hello from Oxford. I hope Oxford is treating you well. I was just there last October. It's a lovely place. I always love the time I have to uh, to spend in Oxford. <clears throat> I don't know when I'm going to be there next, but uh, <laughs> I'll have to let people know ahead of time. That would be great to do some kind of meet and greet in Oxford. I think that would be fun. <clears throat> hey, Dr. Dan, did the disciples actually worship Jesus? Uh, the... The Gospel of John, uh, they, they they have the the Gospels have the disciples like bowing down proskinesis, which is a type of worship, but can also just be um, <clears throat> genuflection, just can be a, a type of respect. So you could say that in a sense they did, but you could also make the argument that they weren't consciously worshiping Jesus. There's a great book by Jimmy Dunn that was published about 14 years ago called Did the did the first Christians worship Jesus? Uh, and it goes through and discusses all the different references to worship and arrives at the conclusion that there's a sense in which the earliest Christians worship Jesus, but it was also distinct from how they worship God. And so a kind of uh, distinct type of worship. So it's a, a bit of an open question. <clears throat> Dan, what's your take on key scriptures that promote legalism? Matt 7.21, Jesus rejecting people for bad behavior. Matthew is, is a Judaizer. Matthew thinks that everyone needs to continue to uh, keep the law of Moses. So uh, Matthew's not giving anybody a hard time for legalism. Matthew says, uh, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Matthew says, you heard Moses say, but I'm ratcheting things up and I'm saying this. Uh, and so uh, that's very much uh, one of the concerns for Matthew. Have you ever read slash watched Invincible or any other comics by Kirkman? Um, I don't know if you can see. Let's see if I can pan up a little bit. So uh, all, the, all three volumes of Invincible. Uh, are up there. Uh, Ryan Otley sent them to me because he heard me say in a live that 
that I hadn't bought a, a hard copy of a comic in over a decade. And he was like, give me your address. And it sent me a bunch of, <clears throat> a bunch of stuff, which is phenomenal. So I've been slowly reading through the, uh, the Invincible series, which, uh, which has been great. And I, and I think his artwork is phenomenal. I'm sure you've been asked this a bunch of times, but in your opinion, what is the closest, most accurate translation of the Bible? Uh, I think that it depends on what you want to do with the Bible. But I generally recommend, if you want the Hebrew Bible and New Testament together, I generally recommend the NRSV UE, so the updated edition of the new excuse me, updated edition of the new Revised Standard Version, which uh, and a good study version of that is. Hang on a minute, I'm trying to open the Discord and and it keeps crashing. Um, the SBL Study Bible is a study Bible that has a, a bunch of great notes and introductions and things like that, and is uh, incorporates the New Revised Standard Version updated edition. So I usually recommend that. The New Oxford Annotated Bible uh, has not yet incorporated the uh, NRSV UE, but that's in the works. It should come out within the next year or two, and I'm, I'm probably going to enjoy it a little more than I enjoy this one, even though I'm actually in here. There's a, a little mini essay of mine that is included as a little sidebar uh, with uh, Exodus 3. So um, <clears throat> if you're trying to access this from, the, or, or if you're trying to chat via the Discord, um, it's I'm opening it, but it's just, it keeps crashing and it's taken a while. So um, I will get there. And if you're not aware, uh, folks who join my Patreon have access to a, a Discord channel that, that I spend some time on, but uh, there's a there's a live stream channel. So any of my live streams, I keep that open and, and you get priority consideration there. <clears throat> Supreme Scientist, thank you so much for the Super Jack question. Why was Elijah the prophet predicted to return in Malachi 4, 5 through 6? Did John the Baptist fulfill the prediction or is that assuming the Bible is univocal? Um, so John the Baptist is is presented as, as um, a type of Elijah because that's how they made sense of it. That's how they read John as, as the, uh, the forerunner, the one who's preparing the way. But why were they predicted to return? Elijah was one of the, one of the people who did not taste death, but was just taken from the earth and specifically the fiery chariot that uh, took Elijah up into the heavens. And so um, <clears throat> with the, along with the Enochic tradition, you had other traditions about folks who didn't die. Um, one day returning, and Elijah was one that became pretty prominent within uh, the Jewish tradition. Okay, let's see if I have to try and reopen the Discord to see if that works. But yeah, the notion that the Elijah tradition from the Hebrew Bible has anything to say about what's going on in the New Testament or with John the Baptist, yeah, that would be presupposing univocality. Um, <clears throat> these were very different authors writing at very different time periods with very different understandings of what was going on. Dr. Dan, outside of the letters in the New Testament, do we actually have any evidence of the Apostle Paul? In other words, even if we can tell the seven letters were written by the one person, is he Paul? He identifies as Paul, and there are no data that suggest the person had any other name apart from Saul. Um, and so there's not really any reason to object to that self-identification as Paul. Uh, great content. Thank you. What is your opinion of the Jesus Seminar's translation of the Gospels as an attempt to determine the authentic sayings of Jesus? I think the, the Jesus Seminars were, were trying to figure out methodologies that could help them to isolate what might have been authentic sayings of Jesus. But uh, I think for their time, they, they moved the football quite a bit, but it's inadequate now. And I think most scholars would tell you that uh, we it's not likely that we can identify any exact words from the Gospels as the actual words of Jesus. The best we can do is identify some kind of like gist ideas or worldviews that might have gone back to the historical Jesus. Hayden Tank, thank you for the question. Why does Moses get to hang out with Elijah at the Transfiguration despite his extraction to heaven being cut from the Torah, but Enoch gets the shaft? <laughs> does Matthew hate Enoch, or do we just have no idea why the third didn't die guy was excluded? Um, I imagine that you, 
you do see Matthew kind of referring obliquely to traditions that are more associated with the Anarchic literature, that the, um, but perhaps in reaction to the Anarchic literature, maybe Matthew was not a big fan because, for instance, you have this idea that the um, the uh, in heaven you're neither uh, given marriage or or marry, uh, but are like the angels of heaven, and and I think the idea there is that you're asexual, um, and so maybe that is. Um, rejecting the notion that there were these disobedient angels um, that were sexual in, from the Anarchic literature. That's an interesting question, though. I'll have to look into that a bit more to see if uh, if anyone has talked about that. Because, yeah, Enoch certainly um, gets the shaft. And not, uh, not in a good way. Uh, Audrey, thank you so much for the question. If you could ask any biblical or apocryphal author to clarify anything, what would you ask? That's an interesting question. Um, um, sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to go back and forth between a few different platforms. That is an interesting question. I think it would probably be, I would have lots of questions for uh, the, uh, the D, the Deuteronomist, authors or editors or whoever was in charge of that, as well as P, whoever was in charge of the priestly stuff, mainly to do with uh, their understanding of um, Israelite history, their understanding of God. Um, you know, I, I research a lot of that. That's uh, what I publish on. And so that's where I would first go if, uh, if I had access to, to those authors. What resources do you recommend for people who are deconstructing from fundamentalism and the fear that goes along with it? I'm, I'm certainly not a counselor, but I think somebody who would probably do a better job than me is Pete Enns, uh, who has written some wonderful books related to deconstruction, such as The Sin of Certainty. Uh, his newest one is called Curveball, and I forget exactly what the subtitle is. He's a big fan of baseball, but uh, it's something like what to do when God throws you a, a curveball. Um, there's another one called The Bible Tells Me So. Uh, I think these are, are wonderful discussions that, that can aid in, in deconstruction when it comes to the fear, though, that is associated with it. I'm afraid that's, that's a little too far outside of my pay grade for me to be able to, um, to say anything <coughs> um, productive about that. I was not raised in uh, religion, so that's it's something I have not dealt with, but I'm, I'm aware that it is uh, something a lot of folks who are raised in religion do have to deal with. Are there any debates on the horizon? I, I don't really do debates. Uh, I think they're performative identity politics. It's just an opportunity to, to get uh, people on your team to cheer for you. Uh, there are much more productive ways to go about uh, debating issues uh, in in print and even through videos, I think can be much more effective. How do I join your Discord? Uh, the Discord is accessible through my Patreon. So uh, patreon.com slash McClellan, M-A-K-L-E-L-A-N. And um, there are, are different levels and all of them include Discord access. Soldier no more. Thank you for the question. How are we to understand 2 John 7 through 10? Um, I, uh, hmm. I don't think there's seven chapters in uh, 2 John. I, oh, there, if there's one chapter, then it'll just be verses 7 through 10. Okay. Well, let's see what this says. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Um, be on your guard so that you not lose what we have worked for, but may receive a full reward. Everyone who does not abide in the teaching of Christ, but goes beyond it, does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive uh, and welcome this person into your house. So this this sounds like <clears throat> kind of boilerplate responding to some of the, the so-called heresies that were popping up within uh, early Christianity in probably the early 2nd century CE. Um, ideas about Jesus being a, a spiritual figure, uh, docetism, stuff like that. And you also have 
as you get into the second century and people are like, uh, it doesn't seem like Jesus is coming back anytime soon. Um, then <clears throat> you have the development of this idea that, oh, there's going to be a falling away or, oh, the the son of perdition or whatever is going to be revealed. And, and you get this idea that <clears throat> before all of this is going to happen, it was supposed to happen in that first generation, but it didn't. And then they, we get all these ideas that there's other stuff that's supposed to happen first, which is also what, Second John is um, is talking about. <clears throat> but thank you for a great question. Hello from Italy. Hello. Um, love the content and love the patience in explaining. Thanks a lot. Grazie. Um, I love Italy. It's been a while since I've been there, but uh, I hope to be back there soon. Oh, um, I guess we can say something. I can say something about this. Uh, my <clears throat> man, I've got something in my throat today. My podcast co-host and I, Dan Beecher, um, are organizing a. Um, we had we were we had two tours in Israel and Palestine scheduled, and obviously that can't happen. Um, and they've got much more important things that they're dealing with over there right now. Uh, in those places, but uh, we are putting together a um, cruise in the Mediterranean that will visit places like Rome and Athens and Ephesus uh, and some other places along the way. Uh, and so I look forward to being back in Italy um, uh, in first week of October later this year. So I will uh, I will get to uh, go get some wonderful gelato. <clears throat> What do the Catholics believe happen once you die? I'm, I can't speak for Catholics, uh, so I, I don't know what the exact process is, um, if there is a single kind of ideology about what happens when you die. Hey, Dan, do you have an opinion about English pronunciation of Greek words? Is there a good argument to stick to the horrible British via Latin rendering instead of something more accurate? I, I just go with modern Greek uh, pronunciation. When I was uh, a scripture translation supervisor for the LDS Church, I had a project that I worked on for all like nine of the 10 years I, I worked there uh, working in modern Greek. So um, I decided I didn't want to have to code switch and go back and forth between the Erasmian reconstructions and modern Greek if I was doing academic stuff or doing my work stuff. So I just, since ever since I had that project, I've just defaulted to using modern Greek. And you know, there's not a right or a wrong answer to that, but that's just my decision. <clears throat> Shelby asks, hi, Dan, can we use literary trauma theory hermeneutics to help us date the NT text, i.e., would the later text show more signs of collective trauma from Roman persecution, and would the more Gentile books show a different flavor of collective trauma? There, there have been attempts to do stuff like that. Uh, for instance, the Gospel of John. Some folks think that that is the anti-Semitism of the Gospel of John reflects the idea that they're being persecuted by um, mainstream Judaism, and so they're kind of setting themselves up over and against mainstream Judaism. Uh, I, I think there are insights that can be gleaned from that, but it's certainly not going to overturn consensuses. It's certainly not going to be able to establish anything incredibly firmly, but I do think it, it can help us think in new and different ways about what we see uh, in the text. Hayden Tank, thank you for the question. You've mentioned briefly before that you don't care for the term animism. How do you prefer to classify deified natural forces like Deaver, Mavet, et cetera, um, personified uh, forces. Uh, I talk about uh, agents and agency, particularly in my book, Adonai's Divine Images, A Cognitive Approach, which is open access. You can access it for free through my link tree or just Googling it. Uh, I, I think unseen agents um, or agency is, is a term that I use to refer to these forces that we conceive to be out there, we conceptualize as out there, and, and some of them are personified, and some of them are objectified, and and they manifest in a bunch of different ways. But but yeah, animism sounds too um, Tylorian and Frazerian for me. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people use it, and I don't like correct people if uh, they use it around me. But when people ask me about it, I say that's that's not my that's not the terminology that I prefer. And, you know, it makes it a little bulkier to try to talk about. Um, 
<clears throat> Dan McClellan must be a millennial. I am right on the cusp or just outside the cusp. I was born in 1980. So the eldest millennial, uh, if you please. But I, I think it's it's fascinating because I, I've, I've lived enough in a world that does not know or does not have easy access to cell phones and the internet to know how that world works. But I also was an early adopter of uh, of those things when they started to be more widely accessible. And so I, I also know how to use those things. So I, I feel like I'm, I'm straddling two different worlds. Dan, how does Adonai, a storm deity, become the creator of existence? Uh, that is by being a group's patron deity uh, when that group adopts more uh, philosophical approaches to the world. And so just kind of getting grandfathered in to, well, our deity is now the creator of existence. But uh, <clears throat> I have argued and, and am developing further the argument that Adonai comes into the pantheon in the second tier as one of the B'nai El Yon, B'nai Elohim, B'nai El, one of the children of the Northwest Semitic Patriarchal High Deity, uh, and the two are conflated probably around 1000 BCE. Some people think a king recognized the value of, of Adonai and their following and conflated the two in order to consolidate power. It seems more likely to me that a, a devotee of Adonai may have acceded to the kingship and may have decided, well, I don't want to have to give preference to one over the other, so let's consolidate power by conflating the two. But a campaign of conflation probably took place that was more or less settled within a couple of centuries. Uh, and so Adonai and El became one. And then Adonai slash El is the patron deity of Israel down into the Greco-Roman period when Greco-Roman period Judaism begins to adopt a more philosophical outlook. Uh, and then you have with Christianity, uh, where, however the parting of the ways happened, Christianity continued to elaborate on and innovate on Greek philosophical ideologies. Rabbinic Judaism kind of um, abandoned that ship and went back to a more Bible-based uh, approach. And so there's still Greek influence and philosophical influence, but some of the things that Christianity came up with between like the the second and the fifth and the sixth century CE, Judaism then adopted, uh, you know, like 500 years later when we get into medieval uh, Jewish philosophy and, and things like that. So yeah, Greek philosophy has, has an awful lot to do with that. Chris, thank you so much for the question. In the context of first century Jew, the story of Nicodemus comes to Jesus, would it be proper to interpret Jesus as saying that water baptism is an essential need in salvific work? Uh, I think they're they're definitely um, acknowledging the necessity of uh, being born of water, uh, but the spirit being born of the spirit is also important there. And both of those things were seen as from above. So um, it's a a birth from above that I think uh, John three is is trying to promote. And yes, water is one of the elements of that. So that and that's probably about baptism which is folding in um, the John the Baptist relationship. Hi, Dan. I was wondering if you had any opinions on the horned Moses interpretation and whether or not you think e-source may have originally meant literal horns on Moses. I'm one of those annoying scholars that thinks that we probably can't speak about J and E sources as full documentary sources. Uh, but I do think that the word there was probably intentionally used to refer to both concepts, both light and horns, which is why in some representations you see horns of light. Um, <coughs> because it can mean both, and both are symbols of deity in ancient Southwest Asia. And so there is a sense in which uh, either of them could have resulted in the same reaction from the crowd and the same need to cover what Moses is doing. I think the light is is probably a little more likely just because the idea of the kavod, uh, the glory, this uh, brilliance that deities have that can be harmful and can signal danger uh, would be the reason that everybody 
was afraid of Moses, uh, and it's related to the idea from uh, Mesopotamia of the Melamu, which was a brilliance with which deities and divine uh, entities and objects were clothed. Uh, there's a, a great um, article by a friend of mine named Seth Sanders that talks about this. And yeah, it's from 2002. I'll just share the, uh, the screen real quick so you can see the article. Old Light on Moses's Shining Face. And he discusses how, you know, for the ancient author, it pro there was probably rhetorical value to appealing to both of these concepts. So if you're interested, that, that paper's from 2002. It's a little uh, older. It's from the journal Vetus Testamentum. But uh, if you're interested in... Um, an academic discussion of this issue, that would be a great paper to go look up. Okay, let's see how we're doing. <clears throat> In light of your next online class, do we know what the Christologies of the disciples were like? What about James, judging based on his letter? There's not really a ton of information in James. Um, we, we really have to try to reconstruct our, our ideas about whoever was writing the texts that we do have. So the Gospels, um, Paul, uh, the pseudo-Pauline authors, uh, the authors of, excuse me, hang on, um, the Shepherd of Hermas has some, some clues to their Christology in it and things like that. But in terms of the, uh, the disciples themselves but who are not, thought to be gospel authors or authors of their own text. I don't think there's much we can determine. Hey, Dan, are your books available on audio? Um, the book I'm working on right now will be. My book right here, I have I've authored to, or authored, I have offered, uh, this is an open access book, uh, so the publishers don't pump a whole ton of funding into it. I've offered to record myself reading it for free, provided um, I can distribute it for free. Uh, and the publishers have not gotten back to me of, about that. So, but the one I'm, the book I'm working on right now, which should should come out in about a year, um, that will have uh, an audio version, and hopefully, I'll be the one to read it. Do you think Richard Carrier is wrong on his argument that Jesus of the Bible didn't exist? Also, how did the mythology surrounding the hispitrical Jesus develop, historical Jesus develop? Uh, I think Richard Carrier is wrong to argue that it is more likely than not that Jesus did not exist. Uh, the overwhelming majority of scholars uh, agree that it is far more likely than not that Jesus did exist. And uh, I think the arguments that, that Carrier brings up are, in, in many cases, problematic. Much of it is based on re reconstructions that aren't really supported by uh, the data. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a paper by a friend of mine. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, Daniel Gulata. Um, reviewed his book on the historicity of Jesus for the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus. Uh, and I think the it goes through and talks about some of the issues with uh, Carrier's approach. I think this is a, a good discussion. And obviously Carrier has, you know, a 15,000 word blog post about why Gulotta is a, is a moron. Um, but <clears throat> I don't think it's adequately engages with most of what uh, Daniel says there. Why is Gospel of John dated relatively late, later than Mark and Matthew at least? That's, uh, I would I would have to go back and look at, at some of the details of the argument, but most of it has to do with the fact that it's such a significant departure from the synoptic gospels and also seems to be addressing the, the conflict between Jesus and Christians and, and the Jewish community is a lot starker than it is in the other Gospels. And so scholars just think this 
seems like this uh, this is later on down the road of of the uh, development of Christianity. But I'll have to go back and look at more of the details of the argument. It's also a more philosophically oriented text. Uh, it's a more developed text. Uh, you have you're pushing Jesus's origins further back into time, like with Mark, it doesn't even talk about Jesus's birth. It starts with his baptism. Matthew and Luke, uh, you have some childhood stuff. You have um, accounts of Jesus's birth. And then John, it's like, no, we're going back to the beginning of time uh, or at least creation. And so uh, there's an idea that as the story continued to develop, there was a need to expand the, the temporal scope of, of what we're looking at. So uh, there are a handful of different reasons, but I, yeah, I'd have to go look at some of the details. Dan, I'm a huge fan and love your videos. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. I hope you'll be able to see this question. It seems I am able to see it. Uh, who were the Magi and what were their significance to ancient Hebrew tradition and culture? Um, so the, the word Magi there is just a reference to uh, probably... Uh, priestly class uh, who from the east, probably from Iran, uh, Persian, uh, Zoroastrian, perhaps, who were uh, astrologers mainly, who were um, diviners. Uh, there's a great book by a friend of mine. Let's see if I have it. I think I have. Yeah, there we go. That should do it. Um, just published a little bit ago called The Magi, Who They Were, How They've Been Remembered, and Why They Still Fascinate by Eric Vanden Eichel. And I even interviewed Eric uh, on the Data Over Dogma podcast a couple months ago, I think right around Christmas time. In fact, I think it may have been the episode that came out on Christmas Day. Uh, but we talked about uh, his book. We talked about The Magi. So if you'd like more information than I am available to... Um, Offer off the top of my head, I would recommend checking out that Data Over Dogma podcast episode and then also picking up um, Eric's book, which is a wonderful book and will be continue to be relevant every year. Uh, we got another Discord question. Since you're heavily pulling from Lewis's origin and character today, um, do you have a recommendation for a similar type of work for later Second Temple conceptions of deity? Hmm... That's that's an interesting question. I don't know that we have a ton going on for that. That's kind of one of the things that I set out to do. Mike Heiser's uh, dissertation on um, on the Divine Council in uh, Second Temple Jewish literature was was a good discussion. Yeah, I can't I can't think of. Um, a ton of works like that. I'm actually, uh, the first book that I proposed when my agent was like, we need to get a, uh, get a book, uh, working. The first book I proposed was a book on how the God of the Bible changes from the earliest layers of the Bible to the latest layers of the Bible down into the new Testament. And so I was, and I think I wanted to write that book precisely because I, I looked to me like there was not a lot of great coverage on the conceptualization of deity and some of the later stuff. Uh, so I was probably trying to fill that gap. And once the, the book I'm working on now is out, I think the second book that I will work on will be how the God of the Bible changes from the earliest to the latest layers of the Bible. So once that <laughs> once my second book comes out, that will probably be the recommendation I would make. What are the top journals in religious slash biblical studies beyond JBL and JAAR? Um, oh, there, there are a handful. Vetus Testamentum is uh, a really good one for Hebrew Bible stuff. Novum Testamentum is uh, a really good one for the New Testament. Journal for the Study of the New Testament is great. Uh, the uh, Vigili Christiani is uh, early Christian uh, journal. There's um, TC, Textual Criticism, is a good discussion of a uh, journal about textual criticism. Dead Sea Discoveries is a journal about uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran and things like that. Um, Ancient Near Eastern or Journal for Ancient Near Eastern Religions. Jainer is a good one for uh, more ancient Southwest Asian stuff. Uh, there's uh, what's it called? Hebai Hebrew Bible and Ancient Israel is um, a really top-notch one. 
uh, that is unfortunately hard to access for, for some folks. Uh, Journal of Ancient Judaism is really good. Journal for the Study of Judaism is really good. There, there are lots of, of good journals out there. MJR Schneider, thank you so much for the question. Hi, Dan, do you agree with Kip Davis's claim that Paul is referencing the Proto-Evangelium when he says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet? Um, I, I certainly think it's plausible. I was wondering, uh, because Kip brought that up a little bit ago in, in response to a discussion I was having about the fact that the serpent from the Garden of Eden isn't identified anywhere in the Bible with Satan. And he brought that one up. And I, I looked up uh, how the Septuagint translates uh, the, uh, the statement about he will, you know, he will bruise your heel, but you will crush his head or, or whatever. And the Septuagint translation completely alters it. It doesn't even say crush. Like, let me uh, pull it up because I forget exactly what the word was. Yeah, in Greek, we have um, 15. There we go. Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, we have the verb tireo, which is like keep or guard. For of you the head he will guard and you will guard his head. And so it... it doesn't seem like that would have come from at least the Septuagint translation that, of that. Is there another translation of that that more um, closely follows after the Hebrew? I don't know. I have not seen one. Um, so it's plausible, but I I don't. I would say I I uh, would lean away from that. But thank you for a great question. Uh, L M A O H H. Excuse me. Uh, thank you for the question. What's the history of baptism? Seeing that is happening at the start of the Gospels. Also, what is the history of the sin concept? Well, the history of the sin concept is uh, is complex, uh, and it's different concepts that are being consolidated in one. Baptism is a little easier. It seems like the concept of the mikvah, which is the ritual um, cleansing bath, uh, is going on in uh, in Second Temple Judaism and is being innovated on by some groups. You see it uh, becoming a daily thing, for instance, at Qumran. And it sounds like John the Baptist was someone who was treating it a little bit differently. And Christianity picked up that concept. Uh, and then it turned into this kind of rite of passage to get into Christianity. So it only happens once. Uh, but I think there's still... Um, some great work to be done on uh, on better understanding the history of baptism. But thank you for the question. Spencer West, thank you for the question. Do you see much Zoroastrian influence on the development of monotheism? Is it just too early? Were the Greeks monotheists? In a sense, they were. But once you get the concept of monotheism developing in uh, the Enlightenment, they actually reject the Greeks as monotheists because Greek monotheism held to the eternal the eternal the eternal nature of matter um it wasn't until the late second century that christians came up with the idea of creation ex nihilo creation out of nothing that you had a challenge to that idea of um the eternal nature of matter and in the enlightenment they rejected that because if there is eternal matter then god is not sovereign over all because that matter was there as long as God was there and God did not create it. And so the monotheism that was developed in the Enlightenment, and that's when the word monotheism was created, is a monotheism that requires creation ex nihilo. And I'm not the only person to acknowledge this. There are many scholars who have pointed this out. And creation ex nihilo simply did not exist until the late second century CE. And so there's no monotheism anywhere in the Bible. Now, Zoroastrianism developed or probably contributed to concepts of dualism and probably contributed to ideas about Satan uh, within Greco-Roman period and Persian period Judaism. But monotheism itself, no, I don't I don't think there were many contributions made on that end. <clears throat> 
Philip Marshall North, thank you for the question. When you read the Bible recreationally, do you do so in the original languages or is a translation good enough for non-academic purposes? I usually, uh, if I'm if I'm just reading recreationally, I'll, I'll read in an English translation. And then I will usually go check out what's going on. If I run into something where I'm like, oh, I wonder, wonder what Greek word there, oh, excuse me, hang on. Ooh. Wonder what, uh, wonder what stem that verb is in. I wonder what, uh, construction they're using there. I studied old English at university and still enjoy reading Beowulf in the original. That would be pretty cool. But when it's later at night, I'm just too tired to put in the extra spade work and we'll read a translation. Yeah, I'm, I'm more or less the same. Richard Carlson, thank you so much for uh, the contribution. Mr. Spencer asks, uh, love your work. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Which books of the Bible would make the best graphic novels and who would be the best artist for the job? Um, I think Judges would be pretty cool. I would love to see Greg Capullo do the book of Judges. I think he would do a pretty cool job. Um, I would like to consult with him so that he knows how things are supposed to look in terms of clothing, in terms of architecture, in terms of weaponry, all that kind of stuff. But I think he would do a phenomenal job of that. Um, I would love to see Esther um, in a, a comic book adaptation. In fact, something tells me that that has been done, done before. Um, but uh, I think that would be cool. Uh, Ryan Otley could also do Judges fairly well. In fact, uh, yeah, that would be cool to see uh, Capullo and, and Otley battle it out over who does the best uh, gore for a book of Judges. Um, Gospel of Mark, I think, would be really cool as well. I think that's, uh, I think that's just the simple, most basic, earliest story of the life of Jesus that we have. I would love to see that. Um, illustrated. I don't know who would be a good, excuse me, I don't know why I'm so tired today. Um, don't know who would be a good artist for that, though. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, though. I'll have to think a little bit more about that. Uh, Jelly Toast Sailor, thank you so much for the question. Um, hey, Dan, throughout Leviticus 18, uncovered nakedness is the euphemism understood to mean sex, used a lot up until verse 20 through 23, including the infamous 22 simply being lie with. Why was the pattern broken? Um, the let me pull it up real quick. I, I think it's because the the other ones are about um, inappropriate sexual relations with people uh, with whom you're already in a relationship, and the um, and it's usually someone from a higher social standing uncovering the nakedness of someone on a, on a lower social standing. And that is not the case once we get to verse 22. In fact, one of the main reasons it's a problem is because these are two people on the same social standing and specifically on the same level of the social hierarchy of domination and penetration. And that's why it's a big problem. Um, so I think that's probably what's going on there. Um, <clears throat> Because all the other ones, it's you know, it's like a sister or the wife of your dad or, or something like that. It's it's always um, a a man and a woman, um, which is considered problematic. Because then once you get uh, to verses uh, twenty three and twenty four, where it's an animal, it's it doesn't go back to uncovering an animal's nakedness because the animal's nakedness is already uncovered. But that is uh, that's a that's a great observation. Thank you, uh, David Aquarius. Thank you so much for the question. Hey, Doctor Dan, I just started reading Jonathan Bernier's Rethinking the Dates of the New Testament. Has it moved the needle? Re dating the NT writings in the scholarly community, as far as you know, N not really. Keep up the great work. I think uh, Jonathan knew this was not going to overturn the consensus, but I think he wanted to get the argument down and just have something in place so that. <clears throat> there was something people could point to and and there was grist for the mill. Uh, I, to my knowledge, it has not really moved the needle much. And, and I think some of the, some of the reasoning in the book is, is a little problematic myself. It, uh, it didn't convince me, but uh, I, we still got a ways to go before we really see how uh, it influences things. And actually uh, one of the, I'm putting together a, a, um, a large scale state of the field biblical studies survey. And one of the things I'm, I'm asking on there is about dating for New Testament texts. 
Bad at pseudoscience. Thank you so much. Um, and and I always screw this up. I never know if it's uh, Viscount or Vicomte. Um, but Julian, thank you so much for uh, the question. Best commentaries on Isaiah that covers second and third Isaiah and Ezra Nehemiah. Why is there so little literature on Persian period Judaism and, and archaeology? Um, I'll start from the end there. Um, there are, uh, there's quite a bit actually on, oh, geez. Excuse me. <clears throat> there are some good things on uh, archaeology in Persian period. Let me just pull some of these up for you. They're in the recent things as well. Uh -huh, uh -huh. No, recent ish. Okay. Uh, do. Oh, and then commentaries. Isaiah. Yeah. So Hermeneia's got the. Uh, I think the best stuff on Isaiah. I think we're waiting on um updates on this let me let me pull up some some stuff do 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 do, do. Eh. Reverend Childs did the one for the Old Testament library that's from 2001 that's going to be very canonical though so um I don't think that's an incredibly helpful one uh do, 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 do. I know there's I know there's some uh, critical international, international critical commentary stuff. Let me see if I can find that. Um, I don't know if it's second like Oh well. Anyway, let me um, see what we've got so far. Okay, so uh, the Anchor Yale Bible Commentary uh, is phenomenal. Uh, this is Blenkinsop's 2002 volume on Deutero Isaiah. I think Blankensop did uh, work on Trito Isaiah as well. I don't know if I have that volume, though, but that's going to be pretty good. It's a little outdated, but uh, it's still going to lay a good foundation. Uh, this is Klaus Baltzer's commentary on Deutero Isaiah from uh, the Hermeneia commentary series, and this is from 2001, so it's also a little outdated, but also I, I would prefer this one to the Blankensop Um so they go through, they give a new translation, they've got some textual notes, and then they'll go through verse by verse and talk about what's going on in these, uh, in these verses. So I, I love the Hermeneia series for that. Uh, Oded Lipschitz and Manfred Oeming uh, from 2006, Judah and the Judeans in the Persian period. Um, Edelman and Ben Zvi, uh, remembering biblical figures in the late Persian period and early Hellenistic period, social memory and imagination is good. Uh, we have <clears throat> Persian influence on Daniel and Jewish apocalyptic literature. That's not really archaeology. Persian royal Judean elite engagements in early Tespid and Achaemenid Empire. Uh, that's going to be a little more specialized. Household and family religion in Persian period Judah and archaeological approach. This is an open access book. Um, you'll notice that the uh, the cover is very similar in design to mine because this is the open access series that SBL publishes. You, so you can Google this title and you can find the PDF of this for free. Um, but that's what I have off the top of my head. Uh, International Critical Commentary also does Isaiah stuff, but in smaller chunks. I don't think they just have like a, a whole Isaiah or even first, second and third Isaiah. But I think that would be a good start for you. Nate, thank you so much uh, for the contribution. And it looks like there's a question here. I'm from the Christadelphian tradition. Lots of love for your content in our community. Well, I, I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you for letting me know. But sadly, some pretty wild prophecy slash end times. Any suggestions for Revelation books? Read uh, Bible for Normal People and McKnight. Um, yes, Kester, <clears throat> which is in the Yale um, Anchor Bible uh series so 
that's me for the top. In terms of the the imagery and what's likely going on there, I don't think you can do much better than this right now. The Hermeneia volume on Revelation, I think, is forthcoming within the next couple of years. And so for the moment, I would say this is the best one that's available from 2014. Uh, that's, I think, uh, if, if you just want to go look at a passage in Revelation and try to see where the scholars stand on that, I think this is the best you can do right now. <clears throat> thank you for a great question. Um, ILLMF, thank you so much. Uh, is there still a chance for me to join your online class tomorrow? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's. I'm not going to shut down uh, registration until like 4 or 5 p.m. my time tomorrow. Uh, and so you can still register. Didascaloy.com. Uh, the website has given us trouble. This is something that's been annoying us for a while. And, and the platform Kajabi is not being very helpful um, in helping us to solve this. Um, <clears throat> uh, but so we have a PayPal that you can also just contribute directly to paypal.me slash M A K L E L A N. If you send a payment there, um, and, or, uh, you know, of a dollar and then just give us uh, an email address and, and your name will get you registered manually. Humanist Swede, infant baptism, biblical or no? The Bible sure doesn't seem to have uh, thought about it, but from what we can see in the Bible, um, none of the authors probably would have supported that. That's that's the product of a lot more um, contemplation on on the all these different aspects of when sin happens and and original sin and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, I, I think I imagine that there's no biblical author who would be like, "Yeah, I'm definitely down for that." Oh, sorry, I keep covering up the Discord. <clears throat> Shelby, do you think Wilfred Smith's 1963 prediction from the meaning and end of religion that scholars would more or less drop the term religion has come true in academia? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Do you think his cumulative tradition and faith idea is still relevant and the best way to think about religion? Um, I think cognitive science of religion has, has um, uh, moved the football quite a bit regarding what religion is. I think a discursive understanding of religion is much better. So Koku von Stuckrad's idea uh, about religion being, um, let me pull that up so, um, so I can get it right. I would hate to get it wrong. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, so. There's a great paper, Discursive Study of Religion Approaches Definitions Implications. And so a discursive uh, study of religion is basically that religion only exists in discourse. There's no meaningful sense in which it exists beyond and outside of and independent of discourse. And so if we want to define religion, we must understand it discursively. And so the uh, definition that uh, von Stuckrad comes up with is right here. We can go a step further and define religion simply as follows. Religion is the societal organization of knowledge about religion. In other words, religion is whatever societies determine religion is. And I, I have made videos before pointing out that uh, that's really the only feature of religion that can be called necessary and sufficient. In other words, if we look at all of the things that have been labeled religion um, throughout time and across cultures, uh, the only feature that is shared by all of them and only by all of them is that they've been labeled religion. And so <clears throat> that would be the best definition. Uh, Fireheart, thank you for the question. Evolutionarily and genetically incest is a bad idea. When did it first become a sin slash unlawful? I, I think before the Bible was was written, people already recognized that it caused problems. Uh, so I think we would have to go into um, anthropology, evolutionary psychology to understand that a little better. But I imagine it occurred pretty early on uh, in the development of Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, <laughs> Craig, for pronouncing the, the O with the umlaut correctly earlier. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my wife still tells me I don't pronounce it correctly. Uh, because she speaks German a lot better than I do, but <clears throat> but I appreciate that. And coming from you, Craig, I take that as a as a compliment. 
Uh, Michael Bell, uh, what's your opinion of the Scholar's Version NT translation by members of the Jesus Seminar published by Polbridge Press? They are in the Complete Gospels and the Authentic Letters of Paul. I've got to be honest, I if I have seen those, it has been many years since I've seen them. So I um, let me see if I can just find them to, to set them aside to read the Complete Gospels. Because I would like to, I, I am always asked about translations of the New Testament. I don't really have, none of them really jump out to me. <clears throat> okay, so this is New Translations of the Bible's four Gospels, plus the Gospels of Thomas, Judas, and Mary, the Q Gospel, the Mystical Gospel of Mark, and 13 other Gospels from the first three centuries. <sighs> and it will not let me uh, look inside. I will have to look those up, see... Um, what I can come up with, but it doesn't—it doesn't seem to me that they've made a big, big splash in um, in the academy. So I'm going to say they're probably pretty limited in, in their utility, uh, and I am probably not going to be incredibly impressed with with the translations. Uh, but I am—I am curious about the translations. Uh, but thank you for uh, that question and for leading me to the. To those translations, I will definitely check them out. Aaron and Brent Metcalf, well, thank you so much, uh, you two. I appreciate that. Love your videos, my friend. Love you. Love your support. Uh, and and I hope things are, are going well for you, too. Uh, Mary, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ronan of Stag, for the super sticker. And back to Julian. Um, interesting old Persian loan words in Hebrew. There are some. We see some Persian... Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I'm trying to think the, the ones I know off the top of my head are, uh, aren't incredibly interesting, but like the, uh, Deuteronomy 33, two, that ends with this reference to, uh, Eshdat and, uh, nobody's really sure exactly what this word means. The translations of Deuteronomy 33, two end in a lot of different ways, a fiery law, excuse me, um, some people talk about angels. Other people talk about Asherah. Um, what are some trends? Uh, NRSV UE. With him were myriads of holy ones at his right, a host of his own. Uh, King James Version, from his right hand went a fiery law for them. Um, NET, with his right hand, he gave a fiery law to them. So Esh dot only means fiery law. If you understand dot to mean law, and that is a Persian loan word. So that is not what Deuteronomy 33 2's authors were trying to say because they wrote that many centuries before that word made its way into Hebrew. So that is a uh, Persian loan word. We have some in Daniel. Um, I don't think we have any in Job, but I could be wrong. I think there are Aramaic loan words in Job. Uh, we've got we've got several in um, Esther. Usually they're like referring to like musical instruments uh, or or um, uh, the titles of court officials. So in Daniel, in uh, other texts, you have references to eunuchs and other court officials where it's it's um, something that's been borrowed from Persian. And I, I, I got to get <laughs> I got to have more at the ready uh, so I can pull more off the top of my head if I could ask that question again. But let me see if I have a something on Persian loan words, because I know I have some stuff on like Greek loan words, Akkadian loan words, Egyptian loan words, non-Semitic loan words. Uh, Persian would be non-Semitic. Persian is um, Indo-European. Let me see if uh, if Noonan. <laughs> I don't know if anybody will get a, a, a Noonan uh, reference, but let me see if uh, Noonan has anything about Persian in here. Uh, the Iranians, non-Semitic contact in ancient Palestine. He's got um, a little bit on the Iranians. Let's see, old Iranian. Evidence for dialect of origin and date of borrowing. Old Iranian. He's got a few pages on that. Um, not a ton. Non-Semitic loan words as evidence uh, for foreign contact in ancient Palestine. It looks like there's one page on the Iranians. 
Yeah, that, that's not going to be incredibly helpful. But I'm sure there's a book somewhere on that. But thank you for the question. Um, sorry, let me get back, back to the Discord. Okay. Um, hey, Dan, was party to an SDA Bible study last night and EGW as the spirit of prophecy was brought up? Was inferred that not believing in EGW's writings and her being a prophet was same as rejecting God as well as SDA religion, and that it would send you to hell. Can you shed light on what the spirit of prophecy is in Rev 19? On reading it, it seems like it is anyone who has the gospel, but SDA claims EGW is the spirit of prophecy. So that would be Ellen White. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to support <laughs> that as just a generic reference to. Um, uh, to anyone who has it, but let me see. Let me pull it up. How long we've we been going? We've been going for an hour, so I'm gonna. I have to wind things down here shortly. Let me just uh, search for the word here because I'm not seeing it. 1910. Um, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, that's that's not a specific individual. There's there's no reason to, to think that. <clears throat> uh, Ronan of Stud, thanks for saying hi and staying awesome. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, and and you stay awesome as well. Steve Acosta, Dan, please organize a date over Dogma Cruise. It would be a blast, and I bet several hundred, if not more, would sign up. <laughs> um, I, maybe, I don't know if you were around earlier, but we are organizing a cruise. Uh, Dan Beecher and I uh, will be leading a, a Mediterranean cruise that will be leaving uh, from Rome. Uh, we'll actually try to be there a couple of days before the, the ship leaves so we can tool around Rome a little bit and see, um, spend a little more time at the sites there. Uh, but it'll hit a few different places, including uh, Ephesus, uh, Athens, Rome. Uh, Crete, uh, and a couple other places I don't remember. But we're still finalizing all the details, so um, registration is not available yet. But we're we're working on that. But um, I think we're 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 going to be like capping it at forty, um, just because it's kind of a short uh, short notice thing um, to stand in for the uh, the tours in Israel and Palestine that we were that um, we can't do this year. So yeah, um, keep an eye on this channel. We'll be um, announcing something once we have pricing set and once we have everything finalized. But uh, thank you very much for the very generous uh, contribution there. Eduardo Morales, uh, thank you so much. Have you ever read R. Crumb's Book of Genesis? I have. Uh, I'm the, the style of art there is not my favorite, uh, but it is, um, it is definitely um, noteworthy that got through the <laughs> uh illustrating everything it's it is an important work uh alex thank you so much for the question can you please do a video about how islam uses old and new testaments and how it develops on them i've thought of a little bit about that it's really outside my area of expertise but but definitely there are borrowings and even some some borrowings from later like christian and jewish traditions including some of the gnostic stuff that and the docetic stuff that that develops in Christianity seems to be picked up in some um, in some Quranic stuff, but it, that's still outside my area of expertise. Uh, Arch Radish, thank you so much for the question, and uh, I hope you're doing well. I um, we haven't talked for a while, but I will be at Dragon Con, uh, just so you know. Uh, hey Dan, where do you get your awesome T-shirts? Asking for a me. Love to play D and D again sometimes. Um, wherever I can find them, there's a, when I go to Comic-Con, there's a, there's a company that I think they go by MTC toys that always has really, lots of really cool t-shirts. So I'll, I always go digging around in, in their, um, inventory for a while. Uh, but heroes and villains is an online place. Uh, I, I bought a couple of shirts that should be arriving within the next week from Etsy recently. And, and I know that's, um, largely non-licensed stuff. I try to stick to the licensed stuff uh, as much as possible. There, there are a handful of other websites that uh, I've gone to that have had 
um, some pretty cool shirts available. But yeah, if you poke around, you can find stuff. And unfortunately, if I Google stuff, then for the next two months, my Facebook is going to be filled with um, <laughs> with ads for uh, for uh, comic book and cartoon T-shirts. But uh, yeah, if you're uh, at, at Dragon Con, let me know. Um, I'd love to sit and uh, join you for uh, a live and in-person round of D&D. Uh, my contacts, thank you so much for the question. You have answered the why of many uh, WTF contradictions in the Bible. Thank you. Well, I'm, uh, you're very welcome. I'm glad that I've answered that question for you. That's something that I, I have tried to include whenever uh, I remember when I'm recording videos. Hand of Omega, thank you so much. If God could only hear his people's prayers on his land, then how did he hear their cries from Egypt? Thanks for all your insights. Uh, it's not that he could own, uh, that God could only hear cries uh, it's, I, I think the way the, the story goes in, uh, the book of Exodus is that the cries had to make their way to God because God was not there, uh, in the very land, but they still made their way, uh, up to God in the heavens. But, uh, God is, is definitely, uh, the text says that God is <clears throat> judging the gods of Egypt, which suggests that, uh, God has, higher authority in the heavens and is coming down to um, to basically do a uh, undercover boss kind of thing uh, and go into somebody else's purview to judge them. Best Chronicles commentary. Um, I've not seen a bunch of, uh, of ones that, that stick out, but let me see what we've got here. So there were two volumes in Hermeneia, and usually Hermeneia is the first one I recommend. Ralph Klein did uh, a volume on First Chronicles from 2006 and Second Chronicles from 2012. There are there, uh, Jaffet from 1993 did an uh, OTL volume on one and two chronicles. So that's the Old Testament library, which is published by Sheffield, which is also a really good commentary series. Um, those are two that I have and, and that I know are high quality, but I'm sure there, there are others. And I imagine that, no, Herman I is not going to be replacing those anytime soon. I don't know about um, Anchor. Anchor will have Chronicles commentaries, and, and I imagine they're really good, but I've I've not seen them. Um, Catherine, thank you so much for the question. Do you believe humans have an innate need for religious mythology? And if so, does that need play into fandoms of properties with complex mythologies, such as the Lord of the Rings and Masters of the Universe? Uh, this goes back to um, the cognitive science of religion. Uh, there are a bunch of features of our evolved cognition that contribute to the development of uh, ideas and concepts that tend to fall under that rubric of religion, such as what I call unseen agents, uh, which are things out there in the world that are influencing stuff. And then there, uh, so on the individual level, we can come up with ideas about this, and then we communicate about them socially. And then if we have ideas about interactions with them or how we have to behave in relation to them, those ideals can then um, be taken up by a social group as tools for prosociality and so ways to curate boundaries and belonging and things like that. Um, Big Gods by Ara Noren Sion is a wonderful book that um, that discusses how these concepts and the mythologies come into play. So I would I would recommend that. Um, Ilka Pisianen is I think a Finnish author who uh, wrote a book called Supernatural Agents, Why We Believe in Ghosts and Gods and Buddhas, uh, also discusses that at some length. So um, I think the cognitive science of religion is going to provide the most thorough response to that. And I, there, I think there is a connection with things like Lord of the Rings and Masters of the Universe. Um, those things, I think, are scratching an itch that is related to what bubbles to the surface in this thing we call religion as well. Uh, from JJ from First Hole at Shuxon Golf Course. <laughs> well, I am envious. Are there any non-biblical writings indicating the evil of the Canaanites? No, the, there's no non-biblical writing that actually even refers to any group known as the Canaanites. That is a biblical uh, creation. Uh, and so all the different groups think everybody else sucks and we're awesome, but nobody else... Um, compartmentalizes a group and calls them the Canaanites. 
Uh, Nun17555, thank you so much. In light of your SMB shirt, I highly recommend Jan Masali's video, How Many Super Mario Games Are There? Lots of parallels to scripture, canon, author, history, consistency. Oh, interesting. That will, that I will definitely look into that. Thank you so much for that recommendation. Uh, there are a lot of those games, aren't there? Um, Resikio, thank you for the question. Regarding your new video about God's father, does that mean that the Martianites had a point saying that there was an older and more powerful God, Abraham's, that was higher than Adonai's Israel's? Um, so if Marcion is appealing to the... Gnostic idea of the Demiurge that Adonai was this lower level JV squad moron who goes out and creates the material world to trap souls in it and things like that. To the degree that it is related to the um, that idea, that is a separate development. Um, I don't think that it is preserving any older understanding of the distinction between Elyon and Adonai. But <laughs> I'd have to look a little bit. My understanding is that we don't really have much directly from Marcion, but we have representations of Marcion's arguments from his opponents. So I'd have to look into that a little bit more and see exactly how they're representing that argument. But I think it's, I think, I don't think it's connected. I think it is a it's arriving at a similar idea, but for a different reason. But thank you for that great question. Um, and this great observation. Uh, Jeremiah, I think it is. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Thank you so much. Bless the maker and his water. Bless the coming and going of him. May his passage cleanse the world. May he keep the world for his people. I'm unfamiliar with that one, but uh, but thank you for sharing that. And I'm curious where that does come from. Hot take question. Who's the worst Hebrew Bible author and worst New Testament author? Worst New Testament author is John the Revelator. Worst Hebrew Bible author? That one's a little tougher. Um, probably probably the, the folks who wrote Chronicles. Not a huge fan of Chronicles. Are you anti-Lamentations? Maybe not a fan of Ezekiel. Um, they don't blow my hair back, but um, but I get what they're trying to do. Uh, I think two Peter's writer just didn't have it in. <laughs> Did John of Patmos sort of suck? John of Patmos entirely sucked. Um, yeah, second second Peter was definitely not written by Peter. Uh, there there is some interesting stuff going on there rhetorically and grammatically, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's something I'm going to have to add to my my survey as well. <laughs> Who sucked as an author? Uh, Steve Acosta, thank you so much uh, for another generous contribution. Dan, you are a successful social media personality. I've been trying to get my YouTube channel, Saltwater Aquariums, monetized. After three years and 137 videos, I still have, only have 43 subscribers. Is it time to give up? Um, if your purpose for doing it is to get subscribers and to monetize, um, it doesn't look great. Uh, but if you're if you enjoy doing it and and the 43 subscribers that you do have really love your videos, then by all means keep it up. But um, I'm surprised that uh, that with uh, do you have more videos than I do? I don't think you have more videos than I do, but uh, but that's still plenty of videos. I don't know how to help you out there, Steve. Um, I'm not uh, I'm not very knowledgeable in saltwater aquariums or to be honest in uh, in YouTube monetization. Uh, I mostly just cross post the stuff that I've posted on TikTok to YouTube. And so it's, it's vertical. And I'm, I'm, I keep telling myself, I'm going to dedicate more time to doing some stuff native to the YouTube environment. But uh, I never seem to be able to get around to it. Because one of the reasons I, I pivoted to doing um, social media stuff full time is because I figured that would give me a lot more time and I'd be able to do more research and I'd be able to do more leisure things instead of working all day every day. Uh, but then as soon as I had a bunch of free time, I went and committed to a bunch of projects that filled it back up again. So um, in May, a lot of that will hopefully ease up. So I'll have more time then. Um, so expect to see YouTube content um, improving um, after May, hopefully. But thank you so much for the uh, for the question. Carl, can you sometime do a video addressing the apologetics for 2 Nephi 521? 
I think I did a video about that. Maybe I do was just commenting on some stuff. Yeah, there have been attempts to try to read the reference to skin of blackness as something other than black skin or dark skin, and I don't think they succeed. Um, I, I think we have to acknowledge that this is reflecting an early 19th century concept of, of, uh, of value judgments associated with skin color. Uh, and yeah, in that time period, um, black folks were seen as, as hard workers and native uh, indigenous peoples were seen as lazy. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons uh, we get that idea in there. They're, they're trying to paint indigenous uh, Americans as, uh, as lazy. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a wonderful, not a book. It was a, um, it was a paper, I think. Just a moment. Jared Hickman wrote a paper. Um, what year? 2014 in a journal called American Literature, volume 86, number three, called The Book of Mormon as Amerindian Apocalypse, and uh, talks at length about the skin of blackness idea and what it seems to be doing. And I, I think uh, that's a great discussion about what's going on. But yeah, I've, I've had a lot of people tag me in, in some of those um, apologetic videos trying to come up with uh, other readings for Second Nephi 5, and, and I don't find them very convincing. Okay, sorry I've not been able to keep up with uh, with everybody. It looks like, is Kip there? Hey, Kip. Great to see you. Let's see. Hey, Dan, is the ancient historical interpretation or intention of the authors of the text more or less important than modern doctrine and dogma for the faithful? What's your intellectual position? Well, the position I've, I've um, cordoned off for my social media content is to address the, um, as best as we can uh, reconstruct it, what the intentions and the goals and the interpretations of the early, earliest authors and editors and audiences. Not because I think that's more important, but because I think that my goal is to confront and, and combat the spread of misinformation. And I want to, and I think the start of doing that is saying, uh, because most of the misinformation is claiming this is what the authors meant. And so I'm starting from there. I'm saying, okay, just right off the bat, let's try to establish what uh, was intended. And that is always, it's a moving target. It is in a lot of ways. It's, we're never perfect at it. Sometimes we, we just can't know, but we're going to do the best we can to try to approximate what they seem to have meant. Excuse me. For the purpose of undercutting attempts to assert what the original meaning was um that insofar as as those assertions are are misinformation but that doesn't mean that the way the text has been used or interpreted between then and now is uh is wrong um i don't think it is at all i think that everybody has to negotiate with the text and and i've always advocated for just um thoughtfully knowingly transparently negotiating with the text uh, and coming up with readings that that serve your goals and interests, but doing so not with the intent of structuring power and values over and against the interests of, of uh, vulnerable, marginalized, uh, oppressed groups, but doing so so that the text can be meaningful for your group. That's what everybody's trying to do with it. And I think there's a responsible and an irresponsible way of doing that. But for me and my house on this channel are primarily what we're doing is trying to combat misinformation by trying to show what scholarship thinks is most likely the earliest um, intended sense. Oh, the water thing is from Dune, huh? I, <laughs> I, I never read Dune when I was in school. Uh, I, I never read it outside of school. I did not see uh, the McLaughlin Dune. I have not seen the first installment of the new one. Uh, but the way my friends talk about it, I, I, I guess I need to go see it.
Okay, I think I've let's see if I got this. Yeah, I think I've mostly caught up to the the end of the discussion. Corey Howell. Hi, Dan. Hi, Corey. Uh, always enjoy your videos. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Especially enjoyed the recent debunking of the April 8th eclipse conspiracy theory. Uh, well, thank you. I've, I've tried to stay out of that just because I've been tagged in so many videos about that. And and there's a lot of overlap, but also some of them just come up with some some wild new claims. And, and so I just thought I, would, I I owed it to people to at least say something about that. I hope I, I tag most of the main bases. What's the most convincing argument to say that Adonai and Elyon are not the same? Um, I would say that the fact that Elyon has a specific divine profile that we find in the Hebrew Bible and Adonai has a very different divine profile that we find in the Hebrew Bible, and those divine profiles map right on to broader Northwest Semitic uh, pantheons, where the one that Elyon has is associated with the high deity, and the one that Adonai has is associated with the second tier deity. And then Deuteronomy 32.8 seems to have the two deities in those two different roles. Uh, and so when Adonai is represented as a storm deity, which is quite frequently, that is representing Baal, the Northwest Semitic uh, north, yeah, the ancient Northwest Semitic storm deity, and we, and as I pointed out in a recent video, we even have Adonai's literature appropriating praise of Baal and basically just replacing Baal's name with Adonai's name. So clearly, <clears throat> the conflict between Adonai and Baal suggests that Adonai is trying to appropriate that role and profile, which would place Adonai on the second tier. Um, Israel, Israel, El is the divine name there, not Adonai. Uh, we have evidence of Israel with El as the patron deity uh, back at the end of the 13th century BCE. We have absolutely no evidence of any deity named Adonai anywhere until the second half of the 9th century BCE. <clears throat> we also have a lot of discussion that only occurs where Adonai is the deity where Adonai is coming up from the south or coming from somewhere else or is not native to um, Israel or the, the northern hill country. So it's a combination of a bunch of different things. But if you want to, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. Uh, Brian Purcell, thank you so much for the question. How do first century Christians view Last Supper regarding eating and drinking bread and wine? Was it just eat together or like our modern communion? I think it was a little more just eat together. Um, in fact, when we look at the earliest witness to outside of the Bible, um, Christian communal meals, uh, Pliny the Younger in 112 CE is talking about how they get together early in the morning to sing hymns to um, their Christ as to a God, and then they come back together and share a communal meal. So I think it was probably a little closer to just eating together. <clears throat> but thank you for the question. The infamous one. Thank you for the question. Could Deuteronomy 23.3 be read against a Davidic kingship? Those born of an illicit union shall not come into the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation. None of their descendants shall come into the assembly of the Lord. Read against a Davidic kingship? Um, that's an interesting reading. I don't think I've I've seen it that way. That would strike me as pretty peculiar. I don't think we have traditions about David coming from an illicit union. But that's an interesting question. Okay, it sounds like we're um, getting ready to, um, to head out. So I'm gonna have to take off here. Thank you so much for your time and for your attention and for some great questions and some very generous, uh, generous, generous um, uh, contributions. Hang on one more question. What's a good textbook for cognitive science or religion for someone with a BA in religious studies? Boo, there are a lot of them. Let me, um, I don't know if there's a, yes, no, uh, white. Give just one second. Introduction to Cognitive Science of Religion by, what's her first name? I always forget, Claire. Claire White. This, um, <clears throat> this is from just a couple of years ago. 
Uh, and I think this is the best you can do uh, when it comes to a straight introduction to the field. An introduction to the cognitive science of religion, connecting evolution, brain, cognition, and culture. Uh, take you to the table of contents, yeah. So introducing it, core assumptions about religion and belief, research questions, methods, the nature of the world, the afterlife, supernatural agents, morality, two parts on rituals, inclusion glossary. So um, for someone with a BA, I, I think that would be uh, right up your alley. And then there will be a lot of references in there so you can go track down um, <clears throat> other things to look at. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Let me just make sure I don't have any other pending. Right. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time and your attention and some great questions. I uh, hope you uh, have people around you who, uh, who you love and who love you. I hope you have a place, a safe place to sleep tonight, enough food on the table. And uh, if you don't, oh, I, I hear a child crying. Uh, I hope you can resolve that stuff soon. Um, I will talk to you all later.